Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night worship. Uh, we're excited to see how the Lord's going to move tonight. And so um, just a quick announcement before we pray and get started with the service tonight. Youth is going to stay in here tonight. All right. So uh, how come it's only the adults uh, cheering that? The kids are like, we got to hang out with the old people. <laughs> All right, let's pray. So, Lord, we come before you, and God, um, we just lift this service up to you tonight, Lord. God, we just pray that uh, your spirit would move, that you would anoint the worship team, Lord, as they lead us in a, in a night of worship. God, I pray for the testimony later on, God, that you would just be with Kathy. And God, in all that we say and do tonight, you would be glorified. Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us now. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. If you could stand with us this evening. So glad you're all here. God is worthy of all of our praise. Amen. Coming on the clouds, kingdom, kingdom will bow down. Every chain will break, as broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting. sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him so open up the gates make way before the king of kings the god who comes to save is here to set the captives free for who can stop the lord almighty our god is a lion the lion of judah he's roaring in power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is a lamb sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord almighty Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sing that again. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord. Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. Oh, his blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Let's sing, Who Can Stop the Lord Almighty again? Amen. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop? 
stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Sing that chorus again to the Lord. Amen. Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb. He's the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Amen. God is good. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Aren't you glad tonight that... We're on Team Jesus. <laughs> Amen. I've been on some other teams, and they, nah, they're not good. But being on the right team, the only team, the true team, Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through him. So tonight, what a blessing we have to worship God. We have a blessing to know that we have direct access to the throne room of God. Tonight, amen, those of us that have called upon the name of the Lord and are born again tonight, God desires that, that fellowship, that communion, that heart communion with him as we sing praises to him tonight, amen. The weapon form, oops, excuse me. Let's try that again. A weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God, he will never fail. Oh, my God, he will never fail. Sing it out to the Lord tonight. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mind. Amen. Every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giants, because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord here we go you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Lord, you turn it for good Sing that again 
You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Lord, you turn it for good Cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I wanna sing verse two of this song again. It says, there's mighty power in the name of Jesus, amen? There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giants. Cause I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord How many of you know tonight that we have victory in Jesus? Amen. Victory in Jesus. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's the name of a song. Victory in Jesus. It's my prayer tonight that we would all continue to desire to build our lives upon the Lord. Not just to come here and worship and, and sing the right words on Sundays and Wednesdays or whatever nights, but that when we leave here, that we're men and women of integrity, that we truly treat others with the love of Christ, that people in our workplace see Jesus in us because we act different, because we love him and we care about him and we're willing to share our lives with him just as Jesus has done for us, amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe 
We live for you. Oh, we live for you. So holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Amen. I will build my life upon your love. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not sing that again. I will build. I will build my beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me amen all right i could have all the kids come up here we're going to sing this song, something about there's power in the blood. Amen. How many of you like this song, There is Power in the Blood? Man, isn't, it, isn't, isn't that just the gospel in a nutshell? Man, I love, I love the words to this song. From your burden of sin There's power in the blood There's power in the blood Would you or evil a victory win There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power Wonder-working power in the blood Of the Lamb There is power working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? Oh, there's power in the blood, there's power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in His blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, there's wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, there's power in His blood. Stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, there's wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you? Service for Jesus, your King. 
There's power in the blood, there's power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in his blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Last time, power, power, there's wonder working power in the blood. Amen. Well, why don't you go ahead and say hello to somebody. The kids are going to stay in here tonight with us. So, All right. Well, we're going to continue on with worship here in a minute. But in the meantime, we have a few announcements and then the worship team will come back up. No, actually, the worship team won't. Kathy Leary will come up. She's given her testimony tonight. Yeah. <laughs> So, but before then, I'm going to bore you with a few announcements. Oh, I like that. So, do we have any first-time guests here tonight? Oh, over here. Well, we have a nice little welcoming package we'll get you. So, uh, yeah, welcome. All right. And everybody else, welcome back. You know what this means, right? But, wait... Out in the foyer, we have a suggestion sign-up list now. So uh, that way, when whoever wins the prize or whatever it is, they'll have a, a choice. And then what we're going to do is have a calendar so everybody can, uh, of the next month, so that it can be planned out and you'll know what the potluck themes are. So anyway, so there is a sign-up sheet out there if you got any good suggestions, because um, let's face it. Barbecue always goes over good. Um, Italian goes over good. And then when it's like Chinese food, everybody's like, how do we cook it even? And nobody brings anything and it's all cookies. So, so we figured we would do it that way. So there is a sign up sheet if you have any suggestions. All right. And so who am I going to? I'm going to pick somebody. Well, Andy was the first one to say something, so what is it next week, Andrew? Uh, next week will be finger foods. Okay, there you go. Finger foods. Hallelujah. I don't know, from that applause, I don't think uh, I don't think that was a real popular selection, but it will be finger foods. Okay. So moving on. Boy, I, I I can already get it. I already know what the picture for finger foods is going to be, but so um, the uh, of course we have Sunday nights at six o'clock. Pastor George does the prophecy service. This coming up Sunday night, it is canceled. Just a reminder. So there won't be the prophecy service. One, he's in California. He drove his mom down there. It's not getting back until. Um, later on in the week, so he really doesn't have enough time to prep, and plus it's Super Bowl Sunday, so it kind of worked out good. So, yeah, exactly. We'll just have a big old party here. So, um, men's prayer breakfast is coming up on the 17th. It'll be at 10 a.m. Um, come join us, men, if you can for that. It's always a great time. I believe Pastor Jerry's speaking this this month. Okay, yeah. So. Join us for that if you can. Then we are privileged to once again have Hearts with a Mission come. And they're on the 18th for both services, they're going to do a little presentation. Um, and Andrew, who works for Hearts with a Mission, will be a part of it. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're looking forward to that. And feel free to heckle Andrew. He's only been on the job for like a week and a half. So... You know, whatever it takes. 
And then we have the movie matinee coming up on the 24th at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary. The movie's going to be The Climb. So join us for that if you can. And last but not least, there, the Oregon's, the Calvary Chapel Oregon's Men Conference is in Corvallis on March 9th. Um, there is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer if you want to go. Um, men sign up out there so we know how many guys we're going. If you can drive or if you need a ride, you can. there's a spot on the sign-up sheet to put that to. So um, please make sure you sign up for that if you plan on going. And if the cost of $10 is prohibitive for you, come see me and we'll work something out. So, and with that being said, um, I'm going to pray and invite Kathy to come up and she's going to give us her testimony. So, Lord, we come before you once again. And God, I just uh, am so grateful, uh, you know, that you're just worthy of our praises, Lord. And we not only praise you through our, our worship, through the singing of our songs, but also through the testimonies of what you've done in our lives, Lord. And God, I pray that you would be with Kathy and um, just to take away any nervousness, if there's any, Lord. And God, may you be glorified and um, as she just talks about your goodness and your graciousness in her life. So Lord, we love you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So one part of this is you have to tell at least one embarrassing story of Dave. Just one. Just one. Oh, put me on the spot. <laughs> no. <laughs> you picked the wrong person for that. <laughs> Good evening. So a verse that aptly describes my life is 2 Corinthians 12.9. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. I'm going to talk about a life that was weak and only became stronger through the power of Christ in me. I was born the second of four girls. My dad was an engineer who was very self-centered and did not participate in family events. My mom was very boisterous, self-centered, and depressed but she was able to teach music lessons at home in the afternoons and serve as choir director in our small church. Our home environment was chaotic, messy, and disorganized, and neither of my parents was interested in parenting. This environment bred in me a sense of fear, insecurity, and feeling unloved and unimportant. But God. During my youth, while my atheist dad stayed home, my mom took us to church on Sundays, but it was just religion, and there was no mention of God during the week, no prayer or Bible reading or teaching of Christian values. Though my sisters and I were told not to lie or steal, we witnessed lying and deception on the part of our parents. Though I knew of God then, I didn't really know God. But when I look back, I can see how he was working in my life. I remember being very afraid of my mom, and when I was five to seven years old, in the morning, I would sit on the stairs of our two-story home, hiding until one of my sisters got up and went downstairs, as I didn't want to be alone with her. When I look back on this experience, I feel that God was sitting there with me. He also let me get caught the couple of times when I tried to steal candy or school supplies from the store which made me vow never to steal again. Also, even as a young girl, God gave me the heart of compassion for others who suffered injustice or need. He would further develop this compassion later on. When I was 15, my life was further altered when my dad left our home without saying goodbye to us kids. A few weeks later, I was walking home from the store at dusk with a bag of groceries and a guy jumped me. Within a minute, though, a car came around the corner, and the guy got up and ran away. The car belonged to a church friend, of course, who asked if I was okay. I kind of got up stunned and never said anything else about it. Then a few weeks after that, our neighbor, who my sisters and I thought of as a second father, pushed me in a corner and tried to abuse me. 
I fought him off. But all these and other experiences made me wonder what was wrong with me that I was so unlovable and just seemed to invite abuse. But as usual, I put those thoughts aside, zoned out, and just went on with life. During my youth, my sisters and I were usually not allowed to go to other people's homes very often. The typical evening was spent watching TV with my mom and sisters. I learned early to escape by studying and by working as soon as I could. I was also kind of a loner, not really knowing how to have relationships with other girls my age. But God, he used my social isolation and studying to keep me from joining social groups that were experimenting with drugs and alcohol. So I never had a drink until I was a freshman in college, and I really didn't like the feel of not being in control. So I never used drugs or drank alcohol. I was a good student, not because I was particularly smart, but because I worked very hard at my studies. I got a scholarship to UC Santa Barbara, and I put myself through college. In my first year at UCSB, I experimented with Christian activities. I went to a church, and I went with a friend to his youth group. Everyone was very nice, but I felt so out of place because they all seemed like good people with nice families and knew how to pray and talk Christianese, and I didn't fit in at all. It would take more time for me to truly feel comfortable with Christians. After a while, I started dating the man who would later become my husband. He was Latino, Catholic, a workaholic, and he was also self-centered, just what I'd grown up with. In the summer of 1977, when I was a graduate student at UCLA, I started attending a Vineyard Fellowship, in part because of the encouragement of my sister, Kim. I became a believer and was baptized. I fell in love with Jesus and started attending a home group Bible study and went to the beach for Sunday services. How does it get better than that? I started reading the Bible and even memorizing some scripture and listening to Christian music. But my boyfriend, who had been gone for several months, returned, and I resumed living with him and, after a few years, finally married him. Yes, we were unequally yoked. Since he was Catholic, we didn't attend church or pray or read the Bible, so I didn't continue to grow much as a Christian for a few years. After I received my PhD, I started working as a research scientist at UCLA and then had my son, Diego. He was a sweet, easy baby and I did everything I could to make sure he felt loved. He was such an answer to prayer, and I told God I would raise him to believe in Jesus. We moved to the Bay Area, and I found a Presbyterian church there and started helping with Sunday school. Diego and I would pray and read the Bible every night before bed. He went to a Christian camp in the summers, and we attended a home group. He loved the Lord. Diego and I volunteered at Bread of Life Christian Ministries many Saturdays, which was a soup kitchen for mostly Latino and African-American families who lived in the area. We would help prepare and serve food. It was important to me that Diego learn compassion for other people. When Diego was about nine through 12 years old, I went through some very painful experiences with my husband at the time and finally left him. No surprise that I had not found a loving and supportive husband or father for my child, since I didn't even know what that looked like nor did I really believe such men existed. But the emotional pain I experienced caused panic attacks and anxiety, though I never told anyone else and pretended all was fine. During the time, I clung to God and knew he was my lifeline. I prayed and read the Bible and read several Christian books. However, I had a hard time trusting God and walked my own path for a while. I was angry that during the divorce, my husband used lies and deception to get others to support him, even turning my father and some colleagues against me and trying to turn my son against me. I was so upset and felt that God was not answering my prayers or blessing my attempts to make morally correct decisions. It all seemed so unfair. I could feel God trying to draw me in at times, and I would resist, and then come back, and then resist again. God eventually healed me from a lot of that pain. However, Diego became somewhat of a prodigal. 
His faith deteriorated when his dad and I divorced, and God didn't answer his prayers to keep his parents together. I felt that his dad convinced him that Catholicism was the real religion, and his dad had remarried a real Catholic woman, and they went to Mass together as a family. Because I was going through my own problems, I allowed myself to get distracted from the most important job I had, continuing to nurture the faith of my son. That is my biggest re regret and failure in life. I've always had a very good relationship with Diego, and he's a very good and caring and loving person, but I would not classify him as a believer. Though I pray for him every day and have tried to talk to him about Jesus, but I leave him in the capable hands of Jesus to draw him as only he can do. I went on to meet my current husband, Dave, at a singles meeting at my church. We hit it off right away. He provided the stability and commitment I really needed. I was still teaching at the university and doing research and working very hard. In addition to having custody of my son and then eventually living with Dave and his daughter and a male friend of his daughter's who had been homeless. I was still having troubles with trust in my ex-husband and it was a challenging at times. Once I finally gave my life fully back to God, my life improved little by little, though I was still taking my life back from God and then repenting again, one step forward and at times one back. Over the years, I continued to believe and draw closer to Jesus, though I never have been the sort of person who could share my faith, as I tend to be rather shy and insecure in social settings. This was especially true at the university, but at this time, God was working on me. I can see how he helped me through my career. He helped me get my job at San Jose State, where 75 people had applied for my position, and then I moved up the path from assistant to full professor very quickly, and was very respected there. He provided many opportunities for me to work with schools and educational organizations around the country. In addition to my teaching and university work, I was able to travel to conferences, write books and research articles, and give presentations, even though I've never been comfortable talking in public. I'm still not. I say all of this not to brag at all, but to show how God used me a very weak, insecure person. He always helped me, but I always did my part as well. God brought Dave and I up to Grants Pass from the Bay Area and connected us with Bob and Diane Bushnell, who we bought property from. We lived in an RV just up the road from them while we built our house, and they were so loving and caring toward us, inviting us to dinner every day. They adopted us into their family and invited us to family and social events. Most importantly, they invited us to Calvary Chapel, and later Bob encouraged Dave to become a deacon. I went to church and read my Bible somewhat inconsistently as I was going back and forth between here and the Bay Area for work, and I was still working a lot. When we moved, when we put our house on the market in the Bay Area, our real estate agent burned it down. We moved back to the Bay Area, and Dave got a crew of guys from CCGP and the community in Grants Pass, and they lived with us while they rebuilt the house. We were on the prayer list, and there were people praying for us that I didn't even know. It was a real testimony to me to see such prayer warriors because I had little experience with that. But there was more. God had plans for me here in Grants Pass and had to draw me away from my work. When Pastor Troy and Margaret came to our church, they started a prayer meeting on Sunday afternoons. We attended every week, and within a few months, the health problems started. Dave had a heart attack, and I watched as God delivered him and restored his health. The heart attack required Dave to go on a medication that resulted in Dave having blood in his urine, which led to a diagnosis of bladder cancer. The amazing thing about that is God had to give him a heart attack in order to show us the bladder cancer. We spent several months with the chemo for bladder cancer and then an experimental treatment at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, traveling back and forth every three weeks for treatments. Then the surgeon said it was time to remove the bladder and cancer before it spread. Several friends and I prayed for the surgery to be successful, for a good place to stay, for safe travel, and God so wonderfully answered all those and many more specific prayers. Then God gave me a project, which I called Pray Them to Heaven, 
to pray for our unsaved loved ones. Almost immediately in December 2018, I got a diagnosis of ovarian and uterine cancer. I asked God why he would give me such a project and then cancer. I knew ovarian cancer was difficult to survive and was not looking forward to chemo, losing my hair, and then a short lifespan. I've never seen medical plans get made so fast. I was set up for a hysterectomy within a couple weeks of the diagnosis at the cancer center in Eugene. I remember being prayed for over by um, Pastor Steve Davis, and he told me, cancer is just a word. God agreed, and amazingly, the oncologist was surprised when he reported he found no cancer. Finally, by mid-January, I was recovered enough to begin work on God's project. What I was surprised to discover was that there was very little information online about how to pray for unsaved loved ones. What I also discovered was that God's little project was growing in scope. I thought we could keep a spreadsheet of all loved ones by having congregants at our church submit the names of three or so people they wanted us to pray for, and then we would pray for these individuals as well. By April, God was letting me know that there was more work to be done. He wanted me to develop a website. So I went to GoDaddy.com and found that the project name could be a domain name. Don't domain name. No surprise there when God is running the show. So PrayThemToHeaven.com was born. I had no clue what content to include, but through much prayer and thought it happened. Within two weeks, the website was completed and live. I finally gave up my career work, and now God is my employer full time. I get together on the phone three times a week with our previous pastor's wife, Margaret, and we pray for all the unloved, for the unsaved loved ones of people in our churches, about 1,150 names so far. We also have a prayer meeting the first Wednesday of the month at 5.30 here at church to pray for our unsaved loved ones, though only a few faithful prayer warriors attend. He also pushed me to use my teaching and research skills to teach women's Bible study on Wednesday mornings. Though I'm still not a people person, he has encouraged me to volunteer with Jesus Pizza Club on Thursdays and to reach out to people at church. He has also blessed me so much with a loving husband who is compassionate and caring and wants to bless others as well, and with my biological and Christian sisters. Now I try to live each day drawing closer to Jesus, reading his word and praying every day, and living a life of trust, obey, and rejoice. He finds new ways to challenge my faith. The most current is that Dave's cancer is back and the chemo has not worked, so Dave must have surgery to remove his kidney. And as I was working on this testimony over the weekend, my son Diego was hospitalized with severe dehydration and was not initially responding on the treat to the treatment, though he has since recovered and is much better. And then on Sunday after church, we had to go to the ER because Dave felt terrible and had another UTI. And then my son's condo in Los Angeles was severely damaged by the storm and is now uninhabitable. But God, I know that regardless of the trials, I can depend on God. He is faithful and trustworthy, and no matter what happens each day, he will take care of me. I can truly say that I have experienced God's marvelous love as described in Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, a love that is so wide and long and high and deep that it surpasses knowledge. At this point in my life, I want to live, as Paul says in Colossians 1, 10 to 11, to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Thank you. I love how humble she is. You know, I wasn't the smartest person in school, but after I got my PhD from UCLA and became a research professor, No, you know, it's just, it's an amazing testimony hearing, you know, what, what God did in their lives. And it's also, um, you know, it, 
as she said, but God, you know, when we've reached the end of ourselves, but God. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about that tonight, you know, because, um, you know, when we as Christians actually live and chase after God, He's in the business of but God. You know, when we're at the end of ourselves, when we don't know how it's going to turn out, when we've had that medical diagnosis that's not good, you know, that the, that the, you know, mortality rate is so high and you don't see a way out but God, you know. And I'm going to, we're going to look at some examples of scripture of just that, you know, that how we can, uh, you know, experience that same thing, you know, because all throughout the Bible, you know, we read the stories of those who didn't finish well. And we read the stories of those who did finish well, you know, and, and what, what, who are we going to be, right? How, how are we going to finish our race? Because we don't know, uh, you know, how long we're going to be on this earth. Only God knows, you know, the, the days of our lives, right? So what are we going to do in the meantime? You know, it's one thing, and we're going to look at examples of Abraham and, and Caleb and, and some others that who trusted God and believed in the but gods, right? And so in the book of Hebrews in chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, it says, be, be, beware, brethren, lest there be any of you uh, with an, any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold uh, the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, right? If, and I love that, and that's really the same concept as Kathy was talking about, isn't it? The but God. You know, are we going to have confidence in ourselves or, or the, uh, the world, or are we going to have confidence and remain steadfast in what God has to say? You know, and we see, uh, you know, in Scripture examples of those uh, who went before us that did just that that they remained steadfast in their confidence, knowing that if God has brought them to something, God is going to see them through it also, right? And, and we don't always know what that's going to look like, but what we do know is God is faithful, and God doesn't change, does he? And God is a God of miracles, you know? We see it not only, uh, you know, in the Bible, but we see it in modern times. You know, um, Kathy's story is a perfect example. You know, and just thinking about, as I said, using Caleb as an example of how he stayed faithful to the end. You know, you guys will remember the story of, of you know, the Exodus where you have, um, you know, all of uh, the Israelites, you know, several million people um, leaving uh, on their Exodus, right? And as they do, God had promised them a land, didn't he? But yet through many lapses of faith, uh, there was plenty of them that gave up or didn't believe or didn't see how God would accomplish. But I love Caleb how even in his older age, he stayed uh, faithful. He stayed steadfast in his confidence. You know, at the age of 85, Caleb said in Joshua 14, 11, it says, as yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. You know, where did Caleb find the, you know, the, the spiritual fortitude, the strength to be able to do it? You know, where did he come up with this insight? You know, and we kind of see earlier on in his life, right? You don't just one day wake up and you have that type of faith, do you? You don't wake up one day and all of a sudden, you know, you're there. No, it comes from living a life that's sold out for God. 
you know, but we see the answer of where Caleb was able to draw upon that strength at that age to be able to, um, you know, live like that at 85 years old. A few verses prior, we read in verse 7 and 8, it says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back a word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. You see, 45 years earlier, Moses sort of had a lapse of faith, didn't he? When he sent spies into the land, right? God had already promised them the land. So what was the point of sending spies, right? They should have just taken the land over. But yet when those 12 spies went out, there was only two who came back and said, yeah, the land's beautiful. Let's go. Let's take it over, right? The other 10 said, oh, there's giants in the land. There's no way. You know, we're like little ants compared to uh, the giants of the land. But see, it was only, uh, you know, those two spies who said, no, but God. Yes, you know, there's all of these giants in the land. There's all of these many people here that are powerful. But God promised us that land. And if he promised it to it, he's going to be faithful and he's going to deliver that land to us. So as Joshua and Caleb, they came back, they give a good report, right? Yes, we need to go take it. It says those other 10 made the hearts of the people melt. In fact, it was to the point that they wanted to kill Joshua and Jacob. It was like, no, these guys are trying to get us killed, telling us to go in amongst all of these giants. But those ten, they weren't seeing the, the but God, were they? They were just seeing with, a, with physical eyes, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the obstacles that were in their way, the giants of the land. And it's no different for us today, is it? You know, that when we, when we trust in God, when we know that He is able, uh, you know, we can move mountains or remove giants from our life, can't we? In Numbers uh, 13, 30, it says, Then Caleb quieted uh, the people before Moses and said, Let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Once again, all of the wisdom that all of the people had, except for Caleb and Joshua, was that we could never overcome these giants. We could never do it. But, you know, I love the, uh, you know, Caleb's attitude. It was, let's go. Let us go. You know, we've got God on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? What are we waiting for? Why do we care if there's giants in the land? What do we care, you know, what their military capability is? Let's, let us go. God's promised us the land. Why are we staying here? Why are we outside of the promise of God? Let's go. Let's take it. We can overcome it because it's not really us fighting our battles anyways. It's him who promised it to us. We might not be able, but he is able. And that's the one we worship tonight, isn't it? We worship him because he is able when we're not. You know, and as part of that, um, you know, uh, to really understand and to really see as I, as I talked last uh, Sunday, I believe it was, you know, um, and I quoted Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? You can't really understand or truly appreciate, uh, you know, what God is capable of doing until you put your faith and your trust in Him. When you know that it's, um, you've been called to something or you have a situation in your life that is beyond you, uh, you know, when we trust God in that moment, knowing that he is able, uh, you know, you don't, you can't really experience, you can't really taste and see. Because as that verse says, unless you taste, you will never see that, you know, unless you fully experience that. And it also, it requires us too to ha activate our faith in that sense, doesn't it? You know, in the book of James chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, talking about uh, Abraham, you know, when he was uh, asked to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah. 
You know, he, that event was, he wasn't saved because of that event, event, but because he was saved, you know, um, his faithfulness to do what God had asked him to do, uh, you know, it says that he was, was justified by it. It says, in the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You know, I, I love um, Martin Luther speaking of this verse. Uh, I read an article on it, and it says, Arguing that faith without works is dead, the book of James so incensed Martin Luther that the reformer called it a veritable straw epistle that should be thrown into the Rhine River. You know, uh, you know, as he wrestled with it. Yet James shows us that without works, then our faith is dead, right? And he gives the example of Abraham, you know, that he trusted God to know that even if uh, um, God would have made him go through with sacrificing his son up there because of the promises that he, uh, you know, that through him, the Messiah, the seed of the Messiah would eventually come. He knew that God was able and could resurrect him, right? And so that's the kind of faith that he had. And it's the same for us, you know, that, uh, just as it, uh, you know, because of that faith and because of that obedience, God counted it uh, in righteousness for him. You know, so we have to not only know that God is able and that he's willing and that he wants to, but we also have to be courageous enough to take those steps to do so. You know, and to give you an example of that, of once again, um, not looking at a situation from from a human perspective, but knowing what God is capable of doing. One of my favorite stories in all of the Bible is, is the story from 1 Samuel 14, where uh, Jonathan's armor bearer, you know, is looking at the Philistines. They're outnumbered. And he was like, hey, I think me and you should just go up there and, and attack the Philistines. Who know what God might do? You know, let's go. Let's just do it and see what happens, right? Because God is capable. And we, we read in 1 Samuel, um, the first six verses, it says, Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrisons that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. I always get messed up on these names. Aja, the son of Atab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phineas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison. And there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sinna. The front of one faced northwards opposite Mishmash, and the other southward opposite of Geba. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come. Let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there's nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. You know, and I love that, uh, that last part of that, that sentiment, because it's so much, it, it's so true for us today. You know, sometimes it gets discouraging or it's easy to become discouraged because we see the nation that we live in as it, as it declines into moral decay and it seems like there's less and less of our Christian heritage and value still here, you know, as they've taken God out of the classrooms and the courtrooms and everything else. You know, and it seems like, you know, um, the only people who are, uh, you know, if, if you're an evangelical Christian, you pretty much offend everybody, right? You know, and uh, it's just the way it is, and that's okay. And as it becomes, you know, you can pretty much spout off any thing that evil thing that you want. But if you, you know, say God bless you, people go bananas, right? Get fired from jobs, whatever it may be. But and it's easy sometimes to, um, you know, to, to like I said, almost get depressed over it. 
But then I read verses like this, you know, that says, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. You know, God doesn't need, uh, you know, a whole army, does he? He just needs a few sold out soldiers that are willing to, as it says, come, let us go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. You know, let's apply that to our lives. Uh, what if a few of us said, okay, let us go uh, to the garrison of the uncircumcised. Right over by the thrift store, there's a whole garrison of uncircumcised people that need it. You look all over, you know, there's even churches in this community that need to be introduced to the real Jesus. You know, um, you know, if it only takes a few, you know, like Jonathan and his armor bearer to say, let's go. You know, because we know as we sit here in a worship service and we worship the God is able, the God that is able, you know, we too need to be like Abraham and make sure that our faith is activated and saying, you know what? Yeah, there's many of them, but I got God on my side. So God and me make a majority. Let's go. You know, what are we waiting for? You know, because they're, uh, you know, the, the time is short. The, you know, the end is drawing near. You know, not trying to be over dramatic, but, um, we're only here for a short period of time. What are we going to do? You know, I'd rather be like Abraham or Caleb or, or Jonathan and his armor bearer. Let's, let's go. You know, let's activate our faith. Let's trust in God and let's just move. You know, because we don't know. Life is uncertain. You know, we have, uh, you know, we're one bad decision away from stepping out in front of a bus on accident or whatever, you know, getting hit by a meteor. I don't know. We don't know how long we've got on this earth, but let's use it, the time that we do have to make sure that we finish well and tell others about Jesus. You know, and the thing about it is we can have that same confidence that Caleb had, that Abraham had, you know, that um, Joshua had. Why? Because the, the same God that they served is the same God that we serve today. You know, and God hasn't changed. He's still in the, he's still in the um, business of, of performing miracles. You heard some tonight. And so Brian's going to come up and do some more worship. But uh, I've asked Josh to, to play a video. I've played it a couple times before. But to me, it's a perfect explanation of the God that we worship and why we're here worshiping him tonight. Josh? The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is a lord of lords. Now that's my king. Do you know him? No means of measure can define his limitless love. Well, well, he's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's impurely powerful. And he's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's a fundamental doctrine of true theology. Do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feet. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? My king is a key of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace 
is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe him to you, but he, he's indescribable. He's indescribable. Yeah. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. And Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Yeah. He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. You can't even teach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my king. like to stand with me if you're able You were the word at the beginning One with God the Lord most high Your hidden glory and creation now Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven down My sin was great, your love was greater separate us now. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Death could not hold you, the veil torn before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring to the praise of your glory. Oh, you are raised to life again. You have no right. What a powerful name it is, the 
We're going to sing uh, two more songs here, and during these songs, I just would, if, if you need prayer tonight, please, um, if I could have a few of the pastors and maybe the elders come forward and be available for prayer, um, prayer is a part of worship. So if you need prayer tonight, please come forward and get prayed for. If you're, if you're sick, the Bible says let the elders pray anoint you with oil and pray for you. And uh, if you're struggling or uh, whatever it is, please come forward and, and get prayer. So we will sing these two songs. And as we do, just come forward if you would like prayer. And there'll be um, people up here to pray with you. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Sing to the Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Set a fire down in 
my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be than here in your love. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. Oh, I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want set a fire. Oh, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, Lord, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, there's no place I'd rather be, but here in your love, here in your love, there's no place I'd rather be, there's no place I'd rather be, there's no place I'd rather be, but here in your love, here in your love, so set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. All right. It's the last song for tonight. If you guys would like prayer, please, we will have one more song here, and just feel free to come on forward. And whatever you may need prayer for, God knows your heart. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up. Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing it out to the Lord. All my life you have been faithful. All my life, All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am in. Nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. Who I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have. I will say. 
the goodness. Your goodness is come running through. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, oh, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, oh, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. Last time, sing it to the Lord. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God, and I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Well, thank you all. We love you. Jesus loves you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Safe travels home. <laughs>